Hi, I'm Shashank Bhargav and you're listening to Three Things, the Indian Express news show. In this episode, we talk about the upcoming Congress presidential elections and why it seems that the majority of the party wants to back veteran Malik Arjun Kharge rather than Shashi Tharoor. We also go over the recent statements made by the current RSS General Secretary. But first, we talk about the UK crisis. About 10 days ago, the newly elected Prime Minister of UK, Liz Truss, and her Finance Minister, Kwasi Kwarteng, announced a new set of economic policies that are being referred to as the mini-budget. The policies included a massive tax cut for the super-rich. And ever since they announced it, the British economy plunged into a crisis. And the decisions were also widely criticised by experts across the world. For example, US Treasury Secretary Lawrence Summers called it utterly irresponsible and the International Monetary Fund said that this would increase inequality in the UK. And following this backlash, Trust yesterday took a U-turn and decided to drop the plan to cut taxes for the highest earners. In this segment, Indian Express's Utit Mishra, who writes on the economy for the paper, joins us to talk about this crisis and the insightful lessons it has for India. So Udit, could you talk about the policies that were announced in this mini-budget? So before I tell you what policies were announced, let me just give you a brief outline of what was happening to the UK economy as we went into this mini budget. So there were two main problems with the UK economy. One was that UK's economy has been in a long term stagnation. Ever since the global financial crisis, UK's GDP has sort of, you know, stagnated. It goes up one year, contracts another year. And the COVID pandemic also made matters worse. So that is a long-term problem that UK was facing. The other problem was that even without much growth happening, UK's economy has been facing very high levels of inflation. These are historic highs, you know, four or five decade highs. And of course, some of that has to do or a great amount of that has to do with the energy crisis that is happening in the wake of the war in Ukraine and, uh, you know, Europe's and UK's complete dependence on energy from Russia. But that put the UK government in a bind because whatever they wanted to do to improve growth would actually worsen inflation and whatever they wanted to do to control inflation would worsen growth. Now, what the mini budget did, it essentially did two things. One, it put the energy price stabilization plan, which is to say that they put a cap on the prices of energies. This is very important because they wanted people who are already suffering with a very severe cost of living crisis to get some relief. So the government decided we will spend some money and take that hit on part of the people. Yeah, and I guess they also did that because winter is approaching and that's when people use a lot more heating in the UK, which means that their energy bills would go up even further. So they had to do something about it now. Absolutely, absolutely. So yes, the winter element is again another crucial bit playing into this whole scheme of things. The other thing that they did was aimed at boosting the economy, which is to say that, which is a very conservative notion that we will give massive tax cuts across the board, especially to the richer people, to the corporates, and that will allow them to have the money in their hands. People with money in their hands will spend. Similarly, businesses with money in their hands will invest. Economic growth will happen. And the virtuous cycle of growth will generate enough revenues for the government to, uh, in some time, be able to raise enough revenues to pay back all this. And the problem with this plan was that this was totally funded by borrowings. This was not done by earning some more revenue from some source or taxing some people and then giving benefits to others. Right. It's not like the government had money and it was giving it to people. Instead, it cut taxes so that people would give less to the government, have more money in their hands and they would go and spend it and boost the economy. Yes. So at one level, this is very much like the freebies that we often talk about, even in Indian setting, the ravery culture that we talk about, that government is giving away money without really knowing where the money is coming from. And where typically the money comes from is from higher borrowings, 
Now, there are two things that can happen when a government borrows more. One, that it prints more money and that money finds its way into the economy and that raises the inflation rate. The other thing that can happen is that or will also happen is that when governments borrow more, they leave actually less money in the market for private sector to actually borrow. That's called the crowding out effect that governments will crowd out the private sector. Now, that was essentially the problem with this whole, on the face of it, very conservative budget, which is about giving tax breaks and restarting the economy, that it was totally unfunded. And that is what snapped the markets. Yeah, so talk about what effect it actually had on the UK economy then. So the budget had a sort of a confused reaction and a panicky reaction in the market because Basically, what the markets felt was that the UK economy was not so strong that it's likely to grow very fast. And they felt that the government is borrowing far more than its capacity to actually spend and repay that loan. So what would typically happen in such a scenario when, you know, even in our personal lives, we do that. We can lend money to a rich man, believing that the rich man will pay us back because we believe that he's so rich and he's so well placed that he'll always pay us back. But when it comes to lending money to the poor, we always wonder whether they'll be able to pay back. Markets had basically a similar question for the UK government. They were not sure whether the UK government will be able to pay back that money. So as a result, they demanded basically more interest rate on lending money to the UK government. Right. They said that if you're going to borrow more money from us, then we want more interest on it because we don't actually trust this decision you're taking. And we have no idea how you're going to generate revenue to pay back the money you borrowed. Yeah. And this interest rate spike was quite substantial. We looked at the charts and these are called yields on government bonds. And they went up from, you know, just 0.4% a year ago to 4.7% now. And just in the matter of that particular day or two, they went up from something like 2 2.5% to 4.7%. So it was a very sharp increase. Listeners must understand that these yields move in thousands of decimal places. So, you know, they move very slowly in that sense. So now if everybody is asking for higher interest rates and government bonds are the most secure loan that you can have. It basically signals that interest rates will go up across the board in the economy. Yeah, and I think that made people nervous because it meant that the interest on their mortgages would also go up, right? Yes. So one effect was directly on the fact that at a time when people were already facing a cost of living crisis, now you're telling them that the interest rates have gone up on their home loans and gone up so remarkably that they have to refinance and possibly put them in a position where they may not be able to refinance. They might have to lose their home ownership also. At a time when winters are coming and energy prices are high and they're already facing inflation all round. So that became a massive political storm. Apart from the economic storm where people didn't want to hold UK assets. For example, the UK currency, pound sterling. And that started falling. So it was a panicky reaction to markets not understanding basically what the UK government was trying to do. In many ways, UK government was, for the first time in a very long time, was actually treated like an emerging market economy. This is how India would be treated if India's government started borrowing money far in excess of its capacity to repay. And this typically doesn't happen with economies in the advanced countries or richer countries like a US or UK. Because again, what I said, if you believe that the rich man is capable and is very rich, you tend to keep lending money to that country thinking that they will always repay. There is a trust in their ability to repay. In UK's case, that mini budget actually became sort of the last straw that, you know, robbed the market of the trust they had in UK's governance. And is that the reason that the List Trust government took a U-turn and decided to drop the plan to cut taxes for the highest earners in the country? Yes, so the important thing again to understand is that that particular specific bit about the highest tax on the highest earners, while it is important to understand that that particular tax on the highest earners only got them £2 billion. 
which was not such a big amount in the larger scheme of the expenditure that they were doing but it had a tremendous negative impact in terms of what it conveyed to the markets because a for people it showed that the government was unfair it was giving massive tax breaks to people who were rich at a time when people who are poor and middle income people were really struggling a person earning a million pounds would get a tax break of 55000 pounds which is roughly the salary of a nurse whereas the nurse herself may be getting just a break of 3 4 5 000 pounds so it was seen as massively unjust and the other thing is that it also showed to the markets that this government lacked the basic fiscal rectitude a basic budgeting acumen for a country like uk that they were willing to let go of tax sources at a time when they actually needed money to boost or smoothen the economy and udit one thing we have talked about in the past is that the nda government under prime minister modi has also refused to increase taxes on the super rich in the country despite the government being low on revenue so could you talk about what lesson this uk fiasco has for the government here so the first thing is that you know there is this whole notion of trickle down economics where the idea is that if you give massive tax breaks to the rich corporates in the economy they will use that money to invest new capacities now on the face of it it makes sense that they will invest that money and that will create jobs and prosperity and the economy will move but as we have seen in the uk fiasco and as we have seen in india's 2019 we had a massive corporate tax cut it was a historic tax cut but it has not actually resulted in a salutary effect on investments now what has happened in india's case is that corporates basically pocketed that money that they would have otherwise paid to the government as tax and they increased their bottom lines their profits went up so if you see that oddly enough in the year when everything was falling apart corporate profits were going up and the bigger corporate the bigger the profits and that's how you see that the sensex and many of these indices have shot up because the profitability of those firms have gone up so one thing is to understand that there are limits to what can happen in trickle down economics and if it's not working in places like uk and us then one should understand that maybe it's very detrimental for a country like india and we need to find other ways or tweak it the other lesson is that of what the prime minister also keeps saying about freebies that you know government cannot simply spend without any regard for where the money comes from okay so one lesson is that when you give tax breaks to the rich there is no guarantee that they will invest that money further and in fact it is very likely that they will pocket that money instead and the second lesson is that it is important for the government to make fiscally sound decisions otherwise markets can punish it what other lesson can we think of yeah so the third thing in this for india in particular is that a lot of people are saying that india is in a good position because listen we do not have this kind of crisis like the west but the important thing to understand is that and they also argue that indian government was wise in not spending that money but it is very important to understand that for india the income levels and expenditure levels are very low and by government not spending or figuring out a way to support those income levels that is the reason why we have a k shaped recovery where huge masses of people are still struggling so you'll see that in everything your two wheeler sales will be struggling but your lamborghinis and mercedes sales might be shooting so it's also important to understand that government not spending just by itself is not a great idea there are times when incomes take a huge hit as it happened with covid and at a time for a economy like india which was already struggling with expenditure even before covid for governments to actually have a counter cyclical approach and spend more and to finance it through different taxes by saying that we did not tax anybody we gave tax breaks to you know the counter argument is that if instead of giving a tax break to corporates in 2019 almost worth 1 lakh 50000 to 2 lakh crores if that money was spent on giving some income relief to the poor it would have actually benefited the economy more 
their demand would have gone up and the corporates would have invested in regardless because they would have found that there is a business case for investing so that's the counter factual or the counter argument to the strategy that this government applied and next we talk about the congress presidential elections for the first time in 25 years the grand old party is all set to elect a new president and one that does not belong to the gandhi family last week rajasthan chief minister ashok gehlot backed out of the race and now the contest is between congress veteran malik arjun kharge and mp shashi tharoor now the election is going to take place on the 17th of october but it appears that the party consensus seems to be in kharge's favor in this segment indian express's manoj cg who writes on the party for the paper joins us to talk about it manoj so what seems to be the reason behind this consensus so in the run up to this congress presidential elections we have heard from congress in fact uh, when mr tarur met the congress president sonia gandhi and members of the gandhi family and the congress also from the leadership it was told that the gandhi family will stay completely neutral in the event of a contest and even the party largely would stay neutral in fact the gandhis would welcome a contest because that will strengthen the inner party democracy the congress then termed this whole contest and the media interest and the various you know permutations combinations the speculations rumors as an example of vibrant inner party democracy the congress leaders several of them pointed out that there is no match no similar election happens in any other political party so that was the background towards the end after rajasthan chief minister ashok gehlot pulled out of the race because of those events which happened in jaipur there was a last minute hunt for a candidate because this is contrary to the professed neutrality of the gandhis but the congress establishment most of the senior leaders they felt there need to be a candidate who has majority of the support on day before the last day of filing of nominations some of these top acc leaders they it seems made a consensus that mr malikarjun khadge should enter the race given his large vast experience in the congress organization right i mean khadge is 80 years old has been the leader of the opposition in lok sabha the leader of the opposition in rajya sabha a nine time mla and one of the most prominent faces of the party who really has risen through the ranks so is it because he is a veteran that he was chosen for this no not exactly because what we are given to understand is that there were several names in contention at least some leaders have told us that mrs gandhi signaled to some of the leaders when they met her that basically she asked them why don't you also contest so it's an open invitation to contest or a nudge or a signal you can interpret it differently so at least mr mukul wasnik who is an acc general secretary he is not young he is not old he falls in that mid ranges of 60s mr bupinder singh hudda the former haryana chief minister kamal nath the president of the madhya pradesh congress committee so at least these three leaders were clearly asked whether they would like to contest for the congress president's post all of them we are told expressed their reluctance they were not keen to contest then finally when it became clear that digvijay singh could enter the fray and to face off with shashi tharoor then this last minute it seems a consensus was arrived at where many of the senior leaders what can be loosely be called as the acc establishment they thought it's better that a leader like mr khadge he enters the race because he carries the weight and the stature on digvijay singh's name there were reservations many of the senior leaders felt he is kind of a polarizing figure so it's not really practical to let him contest against mr tarur so that is why this whole discussion and we are told even ajay makan who is the acc general secretary in charge of rajasthan was also in the contention but it's not very clear whether he was spoken to at least given to understand that loosely some names were there some young old north south all those permutations and combinations were considered and finally the consensus was on mr khadge's candidature so that's how he entered the race of course shashi tharoor the lok sabha mp from tiruvananthapuram he had already made it very clear that he is going to contest okay and one development in the middle of all this that happened on sunday was that when tharoor called khadge khadge told him that it would be better if 
one person emerged as the consensus name for the post, basically telling Tharoor that he should withdraw. And Tharoor pushed back and said that there should be a fight in a democracy. So how do you see this thing that Kharge did and what Tharoor's response was? So Tharoor, of course, since he has already done the homework on the day of filing his nomination, he even released a manifesto. So he has done enough groundwork for this contest. And after filing nominations, when he was asked whether he would withdraw, he made it very clear that, see, I have done all this groundwork. I have taken pains to you know, reach out to Congress leaders across the country. I've got 60 signatures. So I cannot let them down and I will, I will contest. I will not withdraw. So when Mr. Khadge told him that, you know, it would be better if there is a consensus, Tarur reply was on expected lines. He said in a democracy, it's always better to have a contest. So that chapter, it seems, is over there that uh, Mr. Tarur will continue. He will not pull out. But Khadge did make this, you know, slight <laughs> departure from the party line because party, generally the sense in the party is that they would welcome a contest. Let there be a contest. The media attention and the talk and the interest around this Congress presidential election, many in the party believe it's, it's very positive for the party. It sets the party apart from the other national parties or other, any of the other parties. Now, Manoj, you earlier mentioned that there has been a reluctance by Congress leaders to contest for this post. Even Ashok Gehloth essentially chose being the Rajasthan chief minister over the possibility of becoming the Congress president. So what is the reason behind this reluctance and what do you think it says about the party? No, it's an experiment which the party is trying to make after a long time. If you remember, the last time the Congress had a non-Gandhi president was from 1991 to 1998. First, Mr. P.V. Narasimh Rao, both as Prime Minister and Congress President, then Sitaram Kesri for two years. But the difference then and now is that then no member of the family was in active politics. So this is an experiment for the the Congress party. So whosoever becomes the Congress president, this issue of uh, no two power centers where three members of the Gandhi family are there, two of them after the election would be past presidents, immediate past presidents, and then there's a new Congress president. So many of the leaders are still not certain or they still can't figure out how this will pan out after the election. So this reluctance perhaps was on account of that. How much powerful or, you know, how much authority will the Congress president wield, given the fact that the Gandhi family is very much active in politics. And secondly, the Congress is in a very, very bad shape electorally, having lost two Lok Sabha elections and a string of assembly elections. So the revival is not an easy task. And there are factional feuds in most of the states whether the party is in power or not, you know, irrespective of the party's strength in that state, within groups, there are factions. So the job of a Congress president, given that situation, is not very easy. So they are all in a, you know, very inenviable position where they are offered the top job of the party, but they are not really keen. And Manoj, do we have a sense who the top leadership prefers out of the two candidates? From the outside, it might seem like it's Kharge, but do we know? No, we can't clearly say who the leadership in the sense who the Gandhis would prefer because they have made it absolutely clear that we have no stake in this election. But huh, the ACC establishment, the large number of the CWC members or office bearers, all of them would prefer Khadge. And it became very clear that, you know, his nomination forms, 14 sets of them, 140 signatures. The names of Ajay Makan, the name of A.K. Anthony, Asho Gelot, Mukul Vosnik, Bupinder Singh Huda, many of these big names in the Congress had backed Khadge. It seems, which Mr. Tarur also claims, that they believe that there will be continuity. And a Tarur presidency would essentially mean disruption. So perhaps the ACC establishment preferred Khadge as a safe bet. He will ensure continuity. And realizing well that message that is coming out of the ACC establishment, Mr. Tarur has argued that I am the person who is aiming for a change. So he's very openly said, if you want to ensure continuity and status quo, please vote for Mr. Khadge. And if you want change in the way the party is run, and if you want reforms, then vote for me. So that is how he is framing the contest. So from the outside also, it seems that would largely be the case that Khadge represents that continuity. And Tarur represents, from his point of view, change. From an ICC establishment point of view, uncertainty. How things will pan out. It will be disruption from their point of view. So both the candidates can frame 
their messages in their fashion but this is how we could see it and in the end we talk about the rss the ideological parent of the bjp on sunday the rss raised issues of poverty unemployment and rising inequality in the country and made an argument for creating a robust environment for entrepreneurship so that job seekers can become job providers during a recent webinar the rss general secretary datatre hosbole said that the fact that 20 crore people are still below the poverty line is a figure that should make us very sad adding that as many as 23 crore people have less than 375 rupees income per day lagbhag 20 crore log garibi rekha ke niche ji rahe hain pratidin na 375 rupaye se kam aaye hain aise log हिंदुस्तान में 23 करोड़ 23 करोड़ पीपल देश में गरीबी है अनएम्प्लॉयमेंट है तो वह एक बहुत बड़ी चुनौती है देश में गरीबी के कारण द वेबिनार वॉज ऑर्गेनाइज बाय द आर एस एस अफिलियट स्वदेशी जागरण मंच एज पार्ट ऑफ इट स्वावलंबी भारत अभियान द अभियान विच हैज बिन गोइंग ऑन फॉर ओवर द पास्ट ईयर इज एन अटेम्प्ट बाय द आर एस एस टू प्रमोट ऑन्टरप्रिनरशिप एंड सेल्फ एम्प्लॉयमेंट by boosting local and rural economies in this webinar hosbole also highlighted that there are 4 crore unemployed people in the country and that the top 1% of india's population has 1/5 of the nation's income and at the same time 50% of the country's population has only 13% of the country's income he also went on to say that a large part of the country still does not have access to clean water and nutritious food now these concerns are in line with what rss mentioned in its annual report that was released earlier this year in which it had made the economic crisis its main focus back then we had spoken to indian express's deepthi man tiwari who reports on the organization for the paper and he talked about the significance of the rss picking this issue and what it means for the bjp that the rss has chosen to pick up an economic issue uh, in its resolution this year rather than social cultural issues which it has been doing year after year at least recently shows that this is a matter of grave concern that unemployment has actually become an issue and this was seen in recent up elections where there were protests about railway recruitment there were protests in bihar and even on ground reporting suggested that unemployment had become an actual issue data also shows that unemployment rates in the country are highest at the moment since say 1950s so it is an issue and rss flagging it is very very significant it shows that in very subtle ways the rss is telling the government that look you have to do something about it or there will be sooner or later massive public anger on this issue rss has come forward to help in whatever way it can and also maybe slightly deflect the anger by saying that you don't government and private sector alone cannot provide you jobs you have to be self employed and there are other ways of generating employment and or we are going to help you do that but at the end of the day this is going to fall on the government and the government has to figure out because it is the government alone which has the resources to help the people through either policy intervention or through some scheme or whatever so yes it in a way both puts pressure on the government and says that we are ready to help you but you have to get your act together you are listening to three things by the indian express today's show was written and produced by me shashank bhargav and was edited and mixed by suresh pawar if you like the show then do subscribe to us wherever you get your podcast you can also recommend the show to someone you think will like it share it with a friend or someone in your family it's the best way for people to get to know about us You can tweet us at Express Podcast and write to us at podcast at IndianExpress dot com.